welcome back. This is Torres, elbow bump. How are you? Are you doing okay? Is your family okay? Remember, if you need anything, please send me an email so that I can try to help in whatever way I can. So lucky you, you get to hear my voice for another lecture. But the best part is we will be continuing to discuss observational studies and designed experiments. Yay! In the last video, we started to discuss variables. If you recall, Variables are characteristic that we want to measure in our research. It is the measurement that is presumed to vary. Some variables can be manipulated, controlled, or measured for the sake of research. Here is the same spreadsheet that I used in the last video. The eight cases are the rows and the six variables are the columns. The variable that does not vary is the grade. This is a constant. Because there are eight cases and six variables, we have 48 observations. If we were to take out the grade variable, then we would have 40 observations because the observation is the intersection between the variable and the case. It's the information that's held there. Gender, grade, and teacher describe qualities about that case. These are qualitative variables. For the gender variable, there's a code book at the bottom of the page that tells you what the different codes stand for. The quantitative variables in this case are tests one, two, and three because they describe a quantity. They describe how many points each case received on each one of those tests. In research, we want to measure outcomes that are related to independent variables and dependent variables. When determining what is an independent variable and a dependent variable, it really just depends on what your study is. So you can identify what you select your independent variable to be and measure the dependent variable. So independent variables are the ones that you can control. That's why you wanna select the one that you want to control, that you want to manipulate depending on what you want to study. For independent variables, we kind of already know what the variability will be within the independent variable. It's either known or taken into account. Depending on your study, there could be several independent variables. The dependent variables are not controlled or manipulated in any way. They're only measured or registered. These measurements are where we believe there will be variation. There can be any number of dependent variables, but usually there's one that is the focus of the study, and that is the one that we're trying to isolate and measure the variability within that variable. Independent variables and dependent variables are a little tricky to describe until we actually start working with examples, like actual studies where there was an independent dependent variable situation. But the summary is this. Independent variables are the variable that is intentionally manipulated by the researcher. It can be controlled by the researcher and the amount of variability or, or differences within that variable is known or there is very little variance. The dependent variable is intentionally left alone. That is the variable that is being measured. And that is what we're interesting learning about. It will vary at an unknown rate. There are different ways to say independent variable and dependent variable. In math, we often say that x is the independent variable and y depends on x. If we were to graph the independent variable, it would go on the x-axis and the dependent variable would go on the y-axis. Another way to see this is that the independent variable is input and the dependent variable is output. Another way to describe independent variable is saying that it's the explanatory variable, and the dependent variable is the response variable. In any of these situations, if you're talking about x, x-axis, input, or explanatory variable, it's still all the independent variable. 
or the IV. For Y, Y axis output response variable, it's still the dependent variable or DV. Let's go back to the ways that we can minimize error. So as a recap, you would identify possible individuals that have the same characteristics as your population. You wanna have an effective sample size. You wanna make sure that you use data sampling methods and that you have some sort of instrument to collect your data. You have a good idea of which variables you have, what type of variables and which ones you plan to manipulate or control, which ones you plan to measure. Let's start looking at the different types of studies you can perform and the assumed risks of those types of studies and how we can minimize the risks, especially to human subjects. We're doing all of these things so that we can minimize error, but also we wanna make sure that we are not causing harm in any of our work. When you're designing a study, you have different choices. There are observational studies and there are designed experiments. In today's lecture, I will focus on designed experiments. A study is a designed experiment if the researcher intentionally manipulates or controls the value or effect of the independent variable. As in all studies, the dependent variable is measured. In a designed experiment, the researcher is trying to measure changes that result from the treatment. In a designed experiment, the researcher actually gets involved in the study. They're causing something to happen in the study. The independent variable is manipulated and the dependent variable is measured. Depending on the design, designed experiments can sometimes determine a cause and effect relationship. Let's look at these two examples of designed experiments. So here you see an ink blot. It's an ink blot test or a Rorschach test. And psychologists would give this to a person and ask them, what is it that you see in the ink blot? The person didn't just come upon an ink blot and start talking about it. The researcher actually had to give them the ink blot. So they were using the ink blot as a stimuli or the treatment, and the person's response was the dependent variable. So in here, the ink blot was the independent variable and the dependent variable would have been the reaction. This bottom study is the ASH study. In this study, the participants would be shown a line like this one, and they would say, based on your perception, which one of these lines is the same length as this example line? And so the person would give their response, but then they put other people in there to give the wrong responses to see if unknowing participant would be swayed by peer pressure. So again, in this situation, the researcher presented these participants with these lines and then had them respond to it. And they measured different kinds of dependent variables. Independent variable was the line, dependent variable was the responses. In these example experiments, the researchers are watching what people will do but it's different than an observational study because this did not just happen where you could study it. This was imposed upon the participants. The researcher had to give them the ink plot. They had to give them the lines, and that's the difference. When designing the experiment, the researcher has to decide if they're going to use a control. In other words, will all individuals in the study be given the treatment or will only some of the individuals be given a treatment and some will not be given a treatment. They would likely continue with whatever factors already exist. When individuals of a group are not given a treatment, this is called the control group. The control group serves as a baseline treatment that can be used for comparison purposes. So you can see what would happen without the treatment and what would happen with the treatment and then compare the two. In the Harlow monkey experiment, the monkeys were taken from their mother at birth and placed in cages with wire fake mothers 
that would give them food. Like they had bottles and it would give them food. So the monkeys associated this wire thing with getting food. But when the monkey was also given this cloth mother that you see in this picture, they found that the baby monkey would spend most of the time with the cloth mother. They thought it was because it was soft and it seemed to comfort the baby and would only go to the wire mother when it absolutely had to eat, like when it was passing out from hunger. But they would spend most of the time with the cloth mother, except when they were super hungry and had to break aside from it. In the Harlow monkey experiment, the wire mother was the control. They knew what the baby would do with the wire mother. The independent variable was the introduction of the cloth mother and the dependent variable was the amount of time that the monkey spent with the cloth mother. This is the Hawthorne experiment and in the Hawthorne experiment they wanted to know what would be the effect on productive work if the employees were told that they were being watched. What they coined the Hawthorne effect is the attempt to change or improve your behavior just because you are being told that you are being evaluated or studied. So when employees were told that they were being watched, they produced more work than employees that were not told that they were being watched. In the Hawthorne experiment, the control were workers that were not being told that they were being studied or evaluated. The treatment was the researchers telling the employees that they were being studied or watched, and then the dependent variable was how productive they were. In each of these examples, the individuals or cases or subjects of the study that continued in the same atmosphere or did not receive any sort of treatment were the control group. The independent variable was the stimulus that would cause a change and whatever was measured to try to describe that change was the dependent variable. So let's look at an example with just a reading program and I'm going to use the same classrooms that I talked about a few videos ago about the new reading program and I have six classrooms here and my question that I want to answer is will the new reading program increase first grader scores more than the traditional reading program? And I have six classrooms. I have Montoya's classroom, Delphi's, Hamlet's, Cortez's, Runyon's, and Schuler's. In this experiment, my population is going to be all first graders because I want the program that I'm interested in learning about to be useful for all first graders. The sample is going to be first graders at this pretend school and I'm just going to call it PS555. The independent variable is the reading program and the dependent variable is going to be their post treatment test scores. So after I get IRB approval and I make sure that not only are the parents and the school okay with the study, but even kids as young as first grade also have to give their consent. So you have to get everybody's consent. So after IRB approval, I'm gonna do cluster sampling and I'm going to assign each one of these six classrooms a number. And then I'm just gonna use a random number generator like random.org to select entire classrooms for study. So the first three classrooms that I pick, I'm gonna use as the control and the next three that I pick, I'm going to use as the treatment group. I have already gone through the random assignment process. I did cluster sampling and I separated the classrooms into three in the control group, which are Cortez, Delphi, and Hamlet, and three classrooms in the experimental group, which are Montoya, Runyon, and Schuler. So now that I know which group each one of the classrooms are in, I'm going to go ahead and give everybody a pretest. So the students are getting a pretest in both of the classes. So all the kids in Montoya, Runyon, and Schuler's group get a pretest, maybe at the beginning of the year to see how they're reading. 
And the same thing happens with Cortez, Delphi, and Hamlet. They also get a pretest to see how they're reading. Up to now, both groups have had the same experience. There has been no change between the two groups. The change happens here, where Montoya, Runyon, and Schuler's classes, in other words, the experimental group, gets the treatment, and the treatment is the new reading program. The control group keeps using the regular traditional reading program. So there is no treatment. We're just doing what would normally happen. At the end of the study, both groups, the experimental group and the control group, would get a post-test. And we would compare the post-test scores with one another to see if there was a significant difference between students' reading ability in the experimental group and students' reading ability in the control group. So I've gone ahead and made a little sample spreadsheet to show you what this might look like. As a review, the rows are individuals or cases. So in this situation, I just took one student from each one of the classrooms just so the spreadsheet wouldn't be humongous. But normally you would take the information from all of the students in the classroom. The variables are in the columns. We have four qualitative variables, which are gender, grade, group, and teacher. And then we have two quantitative variables, which are the pretest and the post-test. The gender is coded with zero as male and one as female. Grade is a constant because we're just working with first graders. And then group is also coded and I coded zero as the control and one as the treatment. So this is all the information here. Now, if I had 30 kids in each class, then I probably would have coded the teachers as well. But this is just an example. You can see that the independent variable is the treatment and the dependent variable is going to be the post-test. So everything is displayed and it's easy for anyone who's used to looking at spreadsheets to pick this up and be able to interpret it. Another method that researchers can incorporate into their studies is blinding. And blinding is when there's a non-disclosure of the treatment to the individual. There are two different types of blind experiments. The first is a single blind experiment. And that's when the individual, the subject case, experimental unit, does not know if they are undergoing a treatment. The other type of blinding experiment is a double blind experiment. And in that case, neither the individual nor the researcher knows which treatment the individual is receiving. By blinding an experiment, whether it's a single blind or a double blind, it starts to reduce bias significantly. A single blind experiment reduces it quite a bit. A double blind experiment reduces it even more. These photographs are photographs of the Milgram study. In this study, the researcher wanted to understand the role of an authoritative voice on people's behavior. So what they did is they brought people in for this experiment. So the, the people knew that they were participating in some sort of experiment, but they thought it was a memory experiment that one person would have to memorize things and the other person would give them some sort of feedback in the form of electrical shock, whether they got the information correct or wrong. So this man in this bottom photograph, he is sitting at this machine here. And if you notice, it has all these levers, right? So this lever starts with very mild shock on the low end. And as you move to the right, the amount of shock became more and more and more. So the person giving the shock was listening to a person's reaction in the other room. And if they got the answer wrong, they would give them a shock and it would increase and increase and increase. Now, there was no one being shocked, but the person here 
that was doing the shocking, that was actually flipping the lever, did not know that. So they did not know that there was no pain being caused to the other person. They thought there was, they didn't know the truth. The participants in this experiment thought they were participating in a memory study, not in a behavior study. So in this situation, the participant was blinded. The researcher knew what was going on. They knew that when somebody came in, that person was going to be the participant and they were going to be getting the instructions and the permission to continue shocking the person that got wrong answers. So this is a single blind study. In Milgram's experiment, there was no control. The independent variable was the instructions and the persuasion of the researchers to try to persuade the man to shock the person that made mistakes on the memory test. The dependent variable in the Milgram experiment was how much the participants obeyed the authoritarian voice, urging them to continue shocking the person that got the wrong answers. In order to quantify this information, the researchers used the levers to describe how much obedience the participant had provided. For an example of a double blind study, I want to look at a study about caffeine and college athletic performance in basketball players. So here our question is, does caffeine affect athletic performance in college basketball players? In this study, the population would be all college basketball players. The sample will be taken from basketball players at the local state university. The treatment or the independent variable will be the caffeine pill. The dependent variable will be their post-study free throw percentages and the control will be a placebo. And a placebo is just like a fake pill. A placebo can be made out of just fiber. Sometimes they'll make it out of sugar. Sometimes they'll just make it out of some sort of chalk. The placebo can be anything that cannot confound the results. After receiving IRB approval, I'm going to use simple random sampling and divide the basketball team into two groups. Half of those students are going to be getting the caffeine pill and the other half are going to be taking the placebo pill. Again, by placebo, it's just a pill that looks just like the other pill, except that it does nothing. It doesn't have caffeine. It's nothing that can affect the results of the study. In order to make this a double blind study, I'm going to go ahead and assign half the students to one group and the other half to the other group. Then I'm going to turn the work over to an independent party. And they're going to decide which one of those groups gets the caffeine pill and which one of those groups gets the placebo pill. They're not going to tell me. Then that party will put the correct pills into, say, similar envelopes, just plain envelopes with the player's name on it. So every player would be getting a tiny envelope with a pill in it that doesn't look any different than anybody else's, except it happens to have their name on it. That's the only difference. So from the student's point of view, everybody's getting the same envelope. And from my point of view as the researcher of the study, the investigator of the study, I don't know what the independent party gave to each one of the students. So all I did is just simple random sampling, gave everything up, they decided how they're going to select which one of the groups dealt with control, which one of the groups dealt with the treatment, and the students just get something that looks identical. They don't know which group they're in. So here's how it's going to work. We do random assignment. So half of the students end up in the experimental group, and we're going to call this the red group, and half of them end up in the control group, and we're going to call this the blue group. And we're going to have free throw percentages 
from before they start actually taking the pills. So when we start, we're going to get everybody's free throw percentage from the red group and everybody's free throw percentage from the blue group. Then we're going to start administering the treatment. When the students come in for their practices, they're going to be given an envelope that has a pill in it and they would take it. At the end of some amount of time, then we would look at the post-treatment free throw percentages. In this situation, the independent variable is the caffeine, the control is the placebo, the control group is the blue group because they're getting a pill and it's not supposed to be doing anything, and then the dependent variable is going to be their free throw percentages after we administered the study. Let's look at how this would look in a spreadsheet. So again, as a reminder, each one of the individuals or cases is a row. The variables are the columns. So we have 10 players here. The variables are gender, position, group, pre-free throw percentage, and post-free throw percentage. The gender, position, and group are qualitative variables, and the free throw percentages are the quantitative variables. Gender, position, and group have been coded. In the code book, gender has zero for male and one for female. So we can see here that only males were in the study. Position, we have the five major positions of a basketball team, starting with zero point guard, one power forward, two center, three small forward, and four shooting guard. And then the group is either zero for control, which was the placebo group, or one for treatment, which was the caffeine pill group. Now, if this was a double-blind study, the helpers in the study, right, the people that were doing things for me so that I wouldn't have access to who was going to be in each group, they would give me this information, but they would remove the group information. That would be kept from me until the end of the study, so I could match it up later. Again, the treatment is the caffeine pill, and that's the independent variable, and the dependent variable is the post-treatment free throw percentage. Regardless if you're a participant, if you're helping out the primary investigator as a helper, an assistant, an independent group, or whether you're the researcher yourself, there's lots of potential benefits to blinding. I will let you read through this slide if you care to, but ultimately what they all have in common is that they reduce bias. The best type of study is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, and it's called RDBPC. When you're looking at medications you might take, or if you're listening to commercials on TV about medications, you will often hear randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. Because for medications, it's even more important to connect the results of the study to the treatment. The example that we just did with the basketball players and the caffeine pills, that type of study is most likely to confidently connect the independent variable with the dependent variable in a cause and effect relationship. So what's the big idea? Today's big ideas are that in a designed experiment, the researcher does manipulate the independent variable. Depending on the design, experiments are more likely to establish a cause and effect relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable as compared to observational studies. Randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies are the gold standard of experiments. So that's it for today. With that said, don't forget to check your emails, check Blackboard, do your homework, and subscribe to this channel. Even better, hit that notification bell so you know when there are new videos for this course, okay? This is your teacher, Torres, saying stay safe, and I will be waiting to give you a virtual elbow bump in the next video. Ciao!